So we're here by the pool. Um, this feels good, I think. Last night for you, Raf, I wouldn't have thought felt particularly good with Germany. The, the, the headline of your piece, what the hell happened? Have you got the answers? Uh, I, I think so, but uh, just to say it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel any better this morning. <laughs> if anything, it feels maybe worse. Uh, a lot of Germany players were talking yesterday and the big takeaway was that, that there were many reasons why a game that they had controlled, that they felt was almost theirs, slipped away in a cat catastrophic fashion. Mm. People were pointing at uh, missed chances up front. They should have been a lot more, more efficient, more ruthless. Dare I say, you know, all the German stereotypes weren't, in sh weren't on show. Uh, the defending, at least for the second goal, was absolutely comical. And in between, what happened was that they lost their way a little bit. Japan pushed up a bit. They put them under pressure and you'd expect Germany to pass through them and stay calm. But they actually, little by little, lost control through wayward passing, through some people not showing up. As Kaikunuan put it very critically, Manuel Neuer said there wasn't enough movement. And Neuer and Gunnar even seem sort of to question the quality of some of the yeah. players on the pitch, which shows you, in my view, that the big takeaway was that this team realized in a very painful way that they can't fully trust each other. And that bodes really badly for for Sunday. So this is this is more than a wake up call. This feels a little bit more like we're heading towards the, the first team meltdown or <laughs> or is that not the case? Yeah, it's definitely more uh, of a wake up call. I think it's waking up and finding that the house is already on fire. Right. And then what can you do? Not maybe not much. Um, the fact that it is Spain, not a more amenable opponent in the second round, the fact that Spain come into this on a, on a real high, it's really set up for, for Germany to get knocked out on Sunday. I, I'm pretty pessimistic. I'm hoping that they will find some sense of confidence, but it's hard to know where it's coming from when some of the doubts seem to be so fundamental. We are by the pool and Raf has yet to have a dip <laughs> since we've been here. He might not he get that chance. <laughs> yeah. So, but I think it was quite interesting what you were saying about the players talking a lot after the game. I was at Argentina, Saudi Arabia. All of the players walked through the mix zone. They didn't want to speak to the media. The only one who did was Messi. Messi basically took responsibility took accountability, spoke to the rights holders, but also to the written press for about five minutes. And they kind of closed ranks, whereas it felt like you got <laughs> a bit yeah. of everything from all of, the, all of the Germans who played part of that last night. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people stopped. Müller stopped, Kimmich stopped, Neuer stopped, Goretzka stopped. Gundogan was the most critical, maybe because he'd actually been the best player mm. until he had to come off and then he saw the whole thing unfold from, from the bench. And I think at some level he must have felt, you know, what, what am I doing here on the bench when you can see what's going on? Of course, he refrained from criticizing Flick directly. He says he was asked about why he was taken off. If he had any explanation, he said, um, no, the, the coach doesn't owe me an explanation. It's not a problem. But I think to compound everything we talked about, yeah. Flick also didn't help his team by taking off Gundogan and taking off Musiala, who were Germany's two best players. And by the end of the game, they had Füllkrug up front and Mukuku, both had never played for Germany before in a competitive game. They had Mario Götz, who hadn't played for Germany in five years, and just all looked a bit desperate and a bit shambolic. Is Miroslav closer not? Not uh, available. available. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke to him before before the World Cup, and he is in great shape. But no, he loves his fishing. Does Miroslav he? Closer. Yeah, when he was Lazio striker, he would go off to Lago Bracciano, where Tom Cruise got married, and he would just fish some freshwater trout. Mm, um, nice. So, don't know if that's keeping him in shape. That's perhaps. yeah. It's Maybe that's the reason why he stayed away from Qatar because. I don't not, think there's much... Not great fishing. Fishing. <laughs> yeah. from, from, from your point of view, Raf, on, on this German situation, 
and we'll talk about the, the off the field, which obviously then transcends on, on field with the armbands and the protests and stuff in a moment's time. But did you see this coming? Was this, was this building, were, were there tensions coming into the tournament? Or is this just like, ah, right, this is just set fire straight away? I don't think you can say it was coming. There were question marks about the fullback positions and they had an effect on the game because Sula played out wide as a very safe option, but then that necessitated Schlotterbeck coming in as a center back and he looked anything but safe in my view and he hadn't hadn't played well but no and as Müller said you know if, you, if Germany win this game which they easily can then you'll find a lot of good things that they've done in this game so it wasn't as if they were bad throughout yeah it's almost as if they threw it away from a position of strength which then makes it worse in my view because it's basically the admission or the realization that you weren't beaten by somebody else you beat yourself and when you do that then you start looking you know why why did this happen then you start thinking okay this guy did that and why didn't we do this and this is almost worse than getting beaten by a side that's just a little bit better than you or sort of edge you out or whatever this this is germany auto destructing are we in danger james of getting too focused on on the big guns and not giving the credit to the other sides, like Japan, like Saudi Arabia, you saw in action against Argentina, in a very similar situation, coming from behind and, and winning 2-1. I think it's only natural, um, because just being in Doha for 48 hours, if you drive into the capital, on the skyscrapers yeah. there, you see these big awnings, uh, which depict Mbappe, Messi, uh, the stars of the tournament um, and and so you're naturally drawn to the star power um, that, that is here I mean for the last 12 years this whole tournament has been built around that you think of the Qataris investment in Paris Saint-Germain who have they signed Messi Neymar Mbappe mm. the three stars of the tournament they're expected to be and so yeah I think in some respects the attention hasn't fallen on Japan going into the tournament. It hasn't fallen on Saudi Arabia, despite how outrageously handsome Hervé Renard is. Um, <laughs> but for me, I mean, the Argentina-Saudi Arabia game was the first one that I reported on uh, since I got here. And you really saw how a crowd can help turn a game. You know, we saw Matt Slater's piece kind of traveling with the Saudi Arabia yeah. fans across the border to the game in Lusail. And when Messi gave Argentina the lead, the Argentina fans there, they were happy about it, but it was almost like they were expecting it. Whereas when Saudi Arabia equalized, the fans there were not expecting it. They couldn't believe it. You really felt the jubilation that they were experiencing. And for five minutes, they really believed and they helped generate more momentum for the team, which led to the second goal. And so that was, a great experience to be here to see that, um, to see how home advantage almost can help Saudi Arabia. I mean, not in a, it wouldn't help Japan, but certainly Saudi Arabia in this tournament. And I don't think you really appreciate that unless you're, you're here um, to, to feel the noise, so to speak. That was I not a plug for one of your books, Raf. It should have been, yeah. though. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of um, you know, another side, you, you were last night at the, at, the, um, at the final game of the day between Belgium and Canada. I suppose it's a similar theme, isn't it? That, you know, an underdog actually almost being given respect because they are then they have players of a higher caliber. <laughs> Why are you bulking? I'm bulking because this is different because this is Belgium actually being just bad. OK, fine. OK, fine. Whereas Germany weren't bad, but carry on. Well, Argentina weren't bad as well you know, in the first half of that game against Saudi Arabia. But let's go back to Belgium. What was surprising about that was, we talk about the golden generation, how this is their last yeah. chance. There was a real lack of cohesion yeah. in the team. It looked, particularly in the final third, that they hadn't played with each other a lot. And okay, Romelu Lukaku was in the stands. He's not even on the bench at the moment. We'll have to see whether he actually plays at all for Belgium at the World Cup. But Michi Batshuayi is a player that Kevin De Bruyne is familiar with, Eden Hazard's familiar with, and okay, he scored what was the winning goal, but pretty much all of the actions from then onwards, yeah, for someone like Kevin De Bruyne, 
De Bruyne was embarrassed to get the Man of the Match award afterwards, saying, I haven't played up to my standards. Kind of, we weren't on the same wavelength. Um, and just a kind of pattern of this World Cup is the big European teams not performing. I mean, apart from France, who fell behind against Australia and then roared back, apart from Spain, the others have really been a, a bit of a letdown. England was okay. Are you not counting them as European I anymore? was flying, so I didn't see that. I see. So, yeah.